Good morning. My name is Alan Spear and I'm a practicing cardiac surgeon from Northern Virginia and the Innova Health System. We're here this morning with uh, content experts to discuss the potential issues, concerns, and challenges regarding graduate medical education, uh, the shortages, impending uh, cost, underserved areas, gender differences, and I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves before we get started. Let's start from the left. Hi, I'm Keith Horvath, a recovering cardiothoracic surgeon, <laughs> uh, presently a senior director of clinical transformation at the Association of American Medical Colleges. Hello, I'm uh, Rania Prevenza. I'm um, an adult cardiac surgeon and I'm associate professor of surgery at the Michael D. Bakey Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Uh, I'm Steve Leahy. I'm the Chief of Cardiac and Thoracic Surgery at the University of Connecticut and Chair of the Workforce on Health Policy. Hi, I'm Michael DeMaio. I am a cardiac thoracic surgeon uh, in charge of graduate medical education and program director at the Heart Hospital and Baylor Scott and White Healthcare System. And I'm Ray Strobel. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Michigan and a cardiothoracic surgery hopeful. Well, thank you all for taking time from your busy schedules to be with us and to address this a uh, pretty controversial issue in that as you we are all aware there are numerous studies that are showing the predicting that there'll be shortages uh, across the board in uh, physicians and this will potentially impact not only in regions but on uh, access to care do you feel that this is valid data that such a shortage is imminent and if so uh, what are some of the solutions that you feel uh, may be available to us to address these problems? Uh, thank you, Alan. That actually is a very um, interesting question. So according to the um, uh, last uh, American Association of Medical Colleges report in 2015, we had uh, 4, 000, uh, approximately 4,400 uh, 4, cardiothoracic surgeons, uh, meaning um, one cardiac surgeon uh, per 72,000 uh, uh, patients. This is actually increased by, from the 2008 report that was um, one uh, cardiac surgeon per 62,000 uh, 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 patients. In addition, if you can see over the last five years, and we can see actually that uh, with regards to the number of active physicians in each specialty, we have seen that in interventional cardiology, there is an increased number by 69%. In vascular surgery, there is an increase from the active practicing physicians from 2,700 to 3,800. That's an increase by 17%. Whereas in cardiac surgery, there's a decrease from the 4,800 to 44, meaning a minus 4.2%. So this actually adds into the projections that by, that by 2025 is going to be a shortage of 1,500 cardiothoracic surgeons. And then, of course, you add the geographic maldistribution that it's definitely, you know, a problem. That's a good point you made about the uh, supply and demand. So as you say, the supply of CT surgeons is decreasing, uh, relatively speaking. And with a population of baby boomers increasing in America, the needs for those services that we provide will be increasing while the supply of surgeons providing those services is decreasing. What do you think is a solution to that? Well, like a lot of problems, it's multifactorial in its cause and therefore the un understanding evaluation needs to be appreciated. As uh, you mentioned in the last survey, to, to de determine the problems in 2012, so I think the need for a survey is probably imminent to understand the problem further as it stands today in 2018. I think that what I call the pipeline of providing the surgeons to the, that we need is uh, diminished. What do I mean by, by that? The number of medical schools and medical students, I think you know this, is increasing. Right. By said some number, maybe 25 or 30 percent, you know better than, than I do. That's Keith. correct, 30 percent. Mm -hmm. So the number of medical students is increasing, but the number of positions available for training cardiothoracic surgeons is relatively stable. And why is that? There's a cap on funding by the federal government to the hospitals that provide and train those resident slots. So there's not an incentive, and in fact, there's no way to pay for those, those training slots as it currently stands. So therefore, the pipeline of producing CT surgeons is currently stalled, if you will. 
Uh, yes, there's a problem with the number, of, there's a concern about the number of people interested in becoming our specialty. I'm glad you're interested in that and we, we welcome you into our services. But there is a number of concerns about training the right number that we need. Thank you. I think that uh, it's fortunate, Dr. Horvath, that you're with us because uh, addressing the cap could be a very real focus from our government relations uh, advocacy group in Washington, working with you uh, in Washington, begin to address uh, legislatively uh, this cap. But we also know that one of the impediments is the cost of education, and this is overwhelming, particularly for those in lower socioeconomic classes not to mention the length of time of training for our specialty and then a fairly fixed length of time that individuals can practice under, under uh, unlike internists that can uh, that really don't have a length of time surgeons are viewed uh, in their 60s certainly in their early 70s to be beyond their uh, competency uh, in many circles so how do we really address the cost? Uh, what can we do? There have been suggestions about loan forgiveness, but it's hard to sell that when cardiothoracic surgeons are viewed as being on the upper level of income generation. But uh, uh, Dr. Mayo, maybe you could. Well, I think you. Could go I, I, I think that I think that there is there is uh, perhaps money out there. Uh, one of the uh, strange things that happened uh, after the Balanced Budget Act in 1997, uh, these caps were, were, were imposed on uh, programs, how many residents they can have, but also uh, funding for those residents. Uh, each resident, uh, depending on a, a fairly complicated formula, but uh, the number of residents in the hospital per, per Medicare bed, they were viewed as, for the first five years, as a 1.0 FTE. After that, in the sixth year, it's 0.5 uh, FTE. So right away, uh, cardiac surgery programs, un unless you're one of the 27 integrated programs, you're going to go more than six years. And so it's very difficult for, for uh, hospitals to be convinced to uh, uh, f really fund these residency, residency slots. So what, what we would like to do uh, legislatively is the way that finances are uh, developed, it's a combination of uh, direct and indirect graduate med medical education funds that come primarily from Medicare. There are some other sources, but primarily from Medicare. And, and, and we would like to say that those programs over the last 20 years or so that have shut down, those slotted funding sources, we don't know really what happened to them. We want to have the ability to uh, uh, ask CMS and the federal government, if it's all right, if we can redistribute those slots. So if this hospital here lost two of their cardiothoracic residency slots, we want to move those slots to a place where the, it's, there is a need for them, whether it's an underserved area or another program that's expanding and they just can justify having those slots. Then there won't be the tremendous financial burden on the hospitals. And that's actually been done in an experimental fashion in Utah, in Utah yeah. mm -hmm. uh, where they have taken that exact concept and gotten a waiver from CMS to redistribute the GME funding. And not only does that help in making sure that the money is going to the right place, but it also helps ensure that the trainees stay in an area that in many cases is short of physicians. So it helps with the maldistribution problem as well. That's right. You know, most residents uh, work within a very short distance of where they train. So that points to that point, that block grant that Utah got with the exception. <laughs> It allowed a more reasonable ge geographic distribution mid than, than currently occurs. Uh, so you have a number of problems, Dr. Spear, like you say, the, the slots are limited, where those slots are, how they're paid for, all those are huge problems that we really wish would be addressed. And you mentioned about the age situation, you know, for example, airline pilots no longer fly commercial after a certain age. So your point about us, what age is, is, is the stopping age for surgeons to stop operating is a real concern. So. As I mentioned, the pipeline, the supply is decreasing, older surgeons that are retiring, there's a huge gap that occurs here. Exactly. Well, let's let's uh, expand a little bit on that age um, mm -hmm. because, Mr. Strobel, you and I represent the two ends of the bell-shaped curve. <laughs> no. uh, I'd like to say that I'm on the younger end, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm probably not. Um, the elephant in the room, uh, work ethic on our younger uh, providers. 
uh, you're interested in cardiothoracic surgeon, surgery, and uh, you are in fourth year of medical school. Yes, sir. Uh, but so much has been made about uh, attracting uh, younger men and women into our specialty and the difficulties because of work-life balance mm -hmm. on lifestyles in general. Uh, is that real? I know you're not, you, you're, I, th I think the term millennial doesn't apply to you because if in the pure sense of the word, there's a new, new name for you, mm -hmm. but because uh, I don't know what it is, but, the, um, <laughs> to, but to be real, how is, when you talk with your peers, uh, when you really get into it, uh, what is the, exactly the problem and what can we begin to do to address this? Because the patient demands after five and weekends aren't going to go away. The extraordinary uh, uh, demands at nighttime, particularly with advanced heart failure, ECMOs, <coughs> et cetera, aren't going to go away. Right. Yeah, I think that's a very uh, timely uh, topic to discuss. and. I think I want to first reassure uh, yourself and, and all my you know, mentors that on behalf of millennials, that uh, millennials who are interested in cardiothoracic surgery are definitely going to bring that understanding uh, that the patient comes first and that cardiothoracic surgeons have to be there for the patient, whether it's you know, eight in the morning or three at night. Um, in terms of how can we uh, address the millennial generation uh, emphasis on work-life balance, I think just starting to have this conversation is, is really all uh, millennials are looking for, just a recognition of the importance of, of family. And I think that uh, this millennial interest in work-life balance really just brings home the importance of addressing the forecasted shortages in cardiothoracic sur surgeons in this country, because I think that is how we're going to address, of course, uh, work-life balance is being able to have a colleague that can step in for you uh, when it's your, your time to be with your family. If I may say, and uh, I add here, work-life balance is extremely important, but also we have to think that it's really sometimes on the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. It's really, we went to cardiothoracic surgery, and this is the deliberate choice. We like to take care of patients, to serve patients, to serve the society, and we have this gratification after we operate when somebody comes to us and says thank you. So being there three o'clock in the morning, I don't think that this considered that is like is not balanced be between like it's we chose to do that. That our choice. So the whole work life balance, I think we I understand that is an ex extremely important point, but the more successful leaders are the ones that they have a very meaningful engage to work and family. And they never said, I spend too much time at work. No, I love my work, that's why I am there. Nobody actually told me you have to be there until 8 o'clock p.m. That's my choice. If I want to leave 3 p.m., that's also my choice. If I'm in this meeting right now, that's my choice while I can be on the beach. So it's really the, the whole work-life balance is something is more about some idea that we have to write books about and talk about, but it's really hard choices mm -hmm. to pursue or not pursue an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I just have a question for you. Yes, I, I don't know if this is true, and I'd be interested in your opinion. I've noticed that this year uh, at the University of Connecticut, uh, the University Hospital, which is physically attached to the medical school, so that I have constant access to the medical students. Mm -hmm. I have many more medical students this year coming into my office and say, please talk to me about uh, cardiothoracic surgery. Is it possible that the millennial, a lot of the younger people today are starting to, to realize that um, it may be unrealistic, they, they may want cardiac surgery, but it's probably unrealistic to expect that you're going to have the same lifestyle as, say, for example, a, a radiologist. That's not to say that radiologists don't have a difficult life. They, they make very difficult decisions. But do you detect that with your, your fellow medical students, that they, they're... Mm -hmm. 100 percent. I think that what you're getting at is it's all about expectations. And uh, if you're uh, passionate about cardiothoracic surgery, I think your expectation has to be that this is, my understanding, a very demanding and rewarding specialty, and that, that takes 100 percent of your dedication. 
and um, that you enjoy it. And I, I do think that medical students are are excited about cardiothoracic surgery and also understand that it's unrealistic to expect that you may have a lifestyle similar to other specialties like the one that you mentioned. Right. Yeah. Dr. Spear, I want to, excuse me, I, I, I want to be, this is not statistically sound, but I detect amongst the medical students and young residents that I'm coming into contact with um, a, a work ethic that's, that's the same as we what we had go, coming up. So I am encouraged by a lot of the younger students yeah. and residents that are that are coming up. I think that if we have this conversation and nurture the uh, proper um, environment, I think we can have a good future for the profession. Uh, yeah. If I may add, uh, one thing that potentially we could consider to add on the curriculum, and this is not for the medical students, but is up for the residents, is actually the monetary aspect of what what academic practice entail or what private practice entail. So were they making the decision, do I want to go to, academic, to academia versus do I want to go into a private group, they really know the pros and cons. Because but but it's not is that becoming less important now that more and more physicians are not necessarily academic, but they are in uh, uh, groups, uh, hospitals. Groups, uh, absolutely. Uh, so but it's I, not really... But I think the monetary aspect, because a lot of residents coming out, they don't really know how it works. Yeah. They don't know coding. They don't know reimbursement. Yeah. This is extremely important that we can really thrive a practice. So adding this to the curriculum, as we have, let's say, ischemic heart disease, is something that we should actually consider, sure. you know, moving forward. Let me just uh, mention uh, that uh, Keith, um, uh, you and Mike uh, co-authored uh, and chair the GME uh, uh, white paper uh, and policy paper. Uh, in our different fly-ins into Washington, do you view that this is going to be uh, of importance is one of the focus directives that we should embrace uh, in the government relations and advocacy world to try to take to our legislators to begin to address the, the supply, the caps, reimbursement, loan forgiveness. I think that's absolutely essential and the good news is there is legislation, a bicameral uh, legislation in front of both the Congress, uh, sides of the Congress, and so all of your contacts and basically everyone that you know re related to those contacts uh, should support the Resident Physician Shortage Reduction Act. Doesn't sort of slide nicely well, well, off your tongue, <laughs> off your tongue, <laughs> but it gets to this problem of increasing the cap. It would add 4,000 new residents uh, to the rolls, and that would go a long way towards helping Good. fight the shortage. But there's also no reliable funding for professional development uh, in, as far as the medical profession is concerned. And so in addition to that additional GME funding, we need uh, Congress to look at funding for other things that are going to help not only with the shortage, but also with training, such as simulation, telehealth, and other technologies along those lines. Well, I'd like to just uh, close by thanking you all for taking time. I feel that uh, it's unfortunate that these video sessions have such limited time frames because we've just touched the surface of these issues, each one of which could be a whole dialogue in and of itself. And, it, and I'm struck that we need to continue uh, the dialogue. We need to look at it from the uh, residency educational slot to really understand better the points that you've made and thank you for your candor and input. We need to address a re doing the survey. We need to understand on our fly-in and legislative points uh, really what our key uh, issues are so we can collaboratively and collectively take that for Congress. But let me thank you again and uh, for your time and your input and we hope this has been a benefit uh, for, for you uh, that are watching this and if you have any questions uh, this can be directed through the STS office as well as our Washington office with Courtney Yale in uh, the district. So thank you again uh, for your interest and we look forward to continuing the discussion.